In our last message, we began to talk about the war on cash and the mark of the beast. We're going to do more about this tonight. We have quite a bit more to talk about on this subject. We took a good look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, where it tells us about the mark of the beast. And we looked up the Greek words that this is translated from. For instance, the word mark, the word compute, the number of a man. We found quite a few terms that really relate to the use of computers. As strange as this is from something that is 2,000 years old. And what we saw as we looked at the text is that the thought that some people have had that the mark of the beast could be some form of technology is not only reasonable, but it even accords with the text itself. Here are a few things that we covered in our program last week, we saw that electronically documenting every person on Earth using biometrics is part of the UN Agenda 2030. Now imagine that within 15 years having every person in the world identified using biometrics. We saw that the World Bank is very much behind this. They see this as part of Agenda 2030, and they see this as very much involved in the banking system. This effort has been accompanied by a war on cash, by MasterCard, and other global banking concerns. And we looked into that quite closely. We're seeing also a cashless society is being touted by major economists and celebrities to create acceptance. Tonight we're going to look into this some more to see where this war on cash is actually coming from. And we noted that the envisioned electronic money system only works if cash is totally eliminated and every person on earth is enrolled in a cashless system. We saw that smart cards are one step in furthering acceptance toward a cashless electronic money system. Phone payments have been another step forward towards that. And biometric payments are another step even beyond that. And tonight we have a video that is talking about some of these things. So we want to take a look at that next. A parking in New York City may soon be as easy as a few taps on your cell phone. But now there's an app for that, Pay by Phone. Here on Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, Renato Cuadrado's parking woes of dealing with receipts and coins and sometimes broken meters are now made simpler, using his cell phone to pay for a spot. Once you sign up for an account, you provide your license plate number and your credit card information. Your license plate number and your credit card information. It wasn't too long ago when food trucks could only take cash. It's a game changer for us um, because we can now accept all forms of payment. It takes every credit card um, and people don't carry a lot of cash. And now Square has made it even easier for people to pay. Put on, Jim. Just by telling the cashier your name. And what's your name? Reese. Users need to download the Pay with Square app and go through the setup. From there, a cashier knows you're a legitimate paying customer. There you are. Because your name and photo pop up on the other end. Name and photo pop up on the other end. Starbucks announcement that it will be using Square in 7,000 of its U.S. stores will accelerate the movement toward a walletless society. A walletless society. Going forward, at some point, we may be able to leave our wallet at home because we're going to have all of the information in the wallet, all of the information in the wallet. 
on our smartphone. With the new generation of smartphones, we'll soon be paying for goods and services with our cell phones. Smartphones are gradually becoming able to do everything, including functioning like a digital wallet. You can even use a smartphone to pay for a train ticket. It's fast and it's easy. Until now, I only used my cell phone for text messages, and I'm amazed at how efficiently this works. But I worry about having all my private information on the cell phone, and I wonder where it would all end up if I lost it. Forget about cash or numbers or student ID cards. Three New Mexico schools were about to start using something in their cafeterias that you would associate more with the Department of Homeland Security, palm scanners. At a lot of schools across the country, this is how kids are now paying for lunches. A quick swipe of their hand called palm vein scanning. A new technology called Pulse Wallet syncs your credit card to the palm of your hand. Using a biometric palm reader, this cardless payment service allows you to pay by simply scanning your veins. When you're going to pay in a supermarket, you enter your uh, four last digits in your phone number, and then you hold your hand above the sensor. Uh, and a transaction takes less than five seconds. So it's a very quick payment solution. I think it's really good. Um, it's easy when I, when I don't have my wallet with me. I can use my hand, so it's really fast and easy. Forgotten your wallet? Don't carry cash? Not a problem. A supermarket chain in the north of France has gotten over all these things by introducing biometric payments. All you need is your finger. We don't need to get our card out. We don't need to fear it being stolen either, given that this system is personalised. To let customers pay without using debit cards, credit cards or even cash, NBC Action News reporter Amy Hawley takes an in-depth look at this controversial technology. Have you ever gone shopping or loaded up your cart with food or clothing and then get to the checkout line and find out you've left your wallet in the car? Well, tonight we'll show you the technology that makes it simple to just touch and go. You'll be able to buy anything from bread to beer if you agree to give the store your ultimate identity. Once you have your grocery scanned, now what do you do? You punch in your PIN number, touch your index finger to the image reader, and you've paid in about three seconds all with the touch of your fingertips. And you put your finger in there, and my name comes up, and she's got all my information. And it's that quick? It's very quick. Love it? Love it. There is a desire by, many, by several forces coming together who do want to add a biometric identifier to um, government identification. So the, the, leading, the leading push in the United States is most likely a biometric added to your driver's license. That biometric is most likely going to be a fingerprint. Under that model, the fingerprint becomes your new social security number. So what does that mean? I'm touching the chair, I'm touching the table, I'm leaving my fingerprints behind. You come along with a piece of tape and some dust, you pick up my print, you stick it on a, a, a fake ID, and now you're me, <laughs> right? As proved by this phony fingerprint that you just lifted up, right? I'm always forgetting my wallet. <laughs> and then I can't find it and I don't know where it is. And the idea that maybe someone could put an RFID chip somewhere where I would just have to wave my arm. It's a very attractive proposition. There are plenty of reasons, I think, to be worried about a cashless society where we have microchips implanted in our hands and simply make our payments in that way. Uh, for one thing, you would be unable to ever make a payment or make a purchase that someone wasn't watching and recording in a database. Marketers would love to get a hold of that. Hackers can hack into that. The government could use it um, you know, to, to, to investigate you or try to control your behavior. With all of these biometric solutions, cell phone and so on, you're able to make payments without cash. So this is a real step forward towards a cashless society. However, you can still go and get cash out of your bank. And the people that you pay using these solutions, they can go and get the cash out of their bank. So it's not quite there to the place where it's a cashless society, but it's getting people very much used to the idea. So when we look at all this and we see this big push towards a cashless system, we wonder 
why now? Why is this happening now? And why is the war on cash heating up? Well, I'm going to introduce you to someone who's going to help us to understand the reasons for that. His name is Martin Armstrong. And he's the lead figure in the movie, The Forecaster. Now, if you live in America, you might not know about this movie because the movie is banned here. In other countries, such as in Europe, you can go and see it. And you can make special arrangements to be able to see it in America. Recently, I viewed the movie, and I thought really it was quite amazing. Martin Armstrong is a U.S.-based trillion-dollar financial advisor. And he's actually... A mathematical whiz, you might say. As a teenager, he became a millionaire. He invented a computer model based on the number pi to forecast cyclical economic events, economic turning points. And this is not just theoretical. As a matter of fact, he and a lot of people that worked with him in his company made a lot of money by accurately predicting what would happen on the basis of this computer program and this theory. And as soon as the financial world found out about this, of course, his advice became in great demand, and people all over the world were looking to him, and people all over the world were making a lot of money who listened to what he had to say, and this is all documented. Well, what happened with Martin is that some prominent New York bankers invited Armstrong to join their club. Now, who are these bankers? Well, in the movie, you see these bankers actually manipulating the downfall of Yeltsin in Russia, actually being able to force him to essentially abdicate, and they were making the way for Putin to come in. These people who control the money of the world, control even the political powers of the world, making this a really interesting movie to watch. But anyway, these people wanted Martin to join up with them because if they had knowledge of this cycle that his computer program showed, then, of course, they'd be able to make even more money and control the economy even more so. But Martin didn't really like these people very much, and he refused to give them his computer program. Shortly after that refusal, his offices were stormed by the FBI, and they confiscated his computer model, and they accused him of a $3 billion Ponzi scheme, even though there was not one single person who claimed they had lost any money from him. So this is a so-called $3 billion Ponzi scheme with no victims. Very strange. Well, I'll leave it to the movie to tell you exactly what happened with Martin. At this point in time, Martin is still making predictions. And he predicts that a sovereign debt crisis will start to unfold, unravel really, on a global level, starting sometime after October 1st, 2015, through sometime in 2017. And his computer program marks this as a major turning point 
in his computer model. This is what he says. He says the war on cash and the push toward a cashless society at this juncture is a desperate effort of the elite to stave off the coming financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis. That's what he says. Now, he's also published this. He said, the conference to tax physical money, that is cash, was held on May 18th, 2015 in London at the Mandarin Oriental Hyde Park in Knightsbridge. Yes, in London, there was a meeting of some of the world's most elite economists and bankers to discuss how they could go about bringing in a cashless society. You didn't hear about the meeting, probably, because Martin says the lack of press coverage was deliberate and intended to avoid sending panic to the people, which would lead to a massive bank run. You know, if you thought you're about to lose all of your cash in the bank, you'd want to go get it, wouldn't you? So, of course, they didn't publicize this. Well, we have the two leading economists who were at that meeting and who subsequently have been pushing a cashless system. And this is quoting Mr. Armstrong. This idea of eliminating cash first floated as a normal trial balloon to see how the people would take it. Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University and Willem Buter, the chief economist at Citigroup, first launched the concept. Their claims have been widely hailed, and their papers are now the foundation for the new age of economic totalitarianism that confronts us. So these are the faces of the new world order that were really tasked with launching this idea, this project of a cashless society. Let's take a little closer look at these men to see who they are. Willem Buter, the London-based chief economist of Citigroup. You see behind him the logos of organizations that he speaks for, including the World Bank Group. We talked about them last week. The Council for Foreign Relations, as well as other globalist organizations. He's very much a front man for these globalist organizations. Mr. Buter has had some problems, personal problems. The Telegraph reported about him. First, it tells us what an eminent economist he truly is, a former member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, actually setting interest rates and things like that for the bank. He's Cambridge-educated, a columnist for the Financial Times, truly a darling of the elite. However, somehow his mistress has caused him a lot of troubles. Apparently, he dumped her, and she's been trying to get even in the press. Plus, she sent him emails, lewd photographs, and in other ways harassed him. And as you read the article, and you think about Pewter pushing this cashless society idea where the bankers have control of all the money, it sort of makes you think, well, if he had that control, wouldn't it be easy for him to make problems like this go away? The bankers would basically be king, wouldn't they, in that situation? And these kinds of problems would be very easy for them to deal with, and they wouldn't have to deal with this kind of embarrassment. Well, here's the other main person 
Pushing the Cashless Society, Kenneth Rogoff, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. And what I'm showing you here is a page from the Bilderberg Meetings official website. Now, you've probably heard of the Bilderbergs. They have a meeting every year. Basically, the elite of the world get together and talk about the direction of the world and where they think it should go and perhaps what they're doing about it. The meetings are secret, so there's a lot we don't know. But we do know that Kenneth Rogoff is one of them. You see also in his picture, you see the logo of the group he's talking at there, the World Economic Forum. This is another globalist group. This is from their website. They have a timeline there on their website, the World Economic Forum. This is directly from their website. They say they're building an international organization for public private cooperation. Now, if you happen to hear our Daniel seminar, we talked about Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, and these are catchphrases, a public private cooperation. This is part of world governance, where governments actually work along with the banks and with businesses and with NGOs to govern the population. And the World Economic Forum is a part of that. They're based in Geneva. And here's a picture from 1992. That was the year, of course, of Agenda 21. And we have Prince Charles there along with the head of the WEF. And they said that they were committed to improving the state of the world by engaging business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. In other words, they're saying, we're going to use our money to change the world to make it what we want. And apparently, Prince Charles wants to help them do that. They're funded by a thousand member companies. Their members typically have more than five billion dollars in turnover per year. That's the poor ones. These enterprises rank among the top companies within their industries, within their country, and they want to be a part of this, playing a shaping role to shape the world according to their image. Here's a more updated picture. Instead of Prince Charles, we have Prince Andrew. And he continues that legacy of working closely with the World Economic Forum, even to this date. Not everybody likes the World Economic Forum. Here in 2006, this is a demonstration against them. This is something that happens quite frequently because a lot of people consider them very totalitarian and consider their agenda as being very totalitarian. So that's who they are. All of them, and especially the central banks, are very concerned about the economy and where it's headed. This is because there's such a huge amount of debt in the world that they know that eventually the economic system is going to completely tank. What they've done so far to deal with that is they've reduced interest rates. This is their typical way of dealing with it. This is what they've done other times in the past. However, this 
particular economic crisis has been so great that they have effectively reduced the interest rate to zero for quite a long time. While it has kept the economy artificially from totally crashing, it's not enough to turn things around. So their problem is that with the cash system that we currently have in the world, there is no way for the interest rates to go below zero. And this barrier of zero is called the zero lower boundary. This has been what has prevented them from being able to try to turn the economy around using their artificial methods. Now, really, there's a question if that would even work, but you know, they might be able to keep things going a little bit longer if they did that. So this is what they're wanting to do. Well, Buter and Rogoff put their heads together along with other leading economists and bankers in order to try and overcome this zero lower boundary. The problem is when interest rates fall to zero, what is the advantage of having your money in the bank. You know, some people might keep their money in the bank for convenience, but really, if it's in the bank, you're actually losing it because of inflation. And if they go lower than zero, which means to, in effect, actually charge you an interest rate to hold your money, what are you going to do with it? You're going to take it out, right? So that makes it impossible for them to actually go below zero on their interest rates. So what William Buter and Rogoff are saying is that if all currency were eliminated, then, of course, people couldn't take out their cash because there wouldn't be any cash. And then nations could retain a zero inflation rate, they say, and still get all the monetary stimulus the nation needs by adjusting the amount of the interest rate below zero. So, of course, what this would mean is that you would then be a hostage to the banking system. Your money would be a hostage because it's just digital money. You can't take it out. It's part of the system. And they would decide, these bankers would decide, if they were going to take money away from you by bringing the interest rate below zero or in other financial circumstances to pay you interest on your digital money being in their bank. They would decide that, not you. That's how this would work. And by doing these manipulations, they think they could then maintain the economy without inflation. Of course, nobody's ever done this. So this is just the theory, right? This is their theory. It hasn't been tested. So imagine changing the monetary system that has existed for a very long time of actual physical money to electronic money on the basis of this theory. Well, Armstrong says that physical paper money provides the check against negative interest rates. This is what keeps the bank from stealing your money, is the fact that you can take your money out. And therefore, if they start lowering the interest below zero, you're going to withdraw your funds. And this, of course, from the standpoint of the bank, is a bad thing because this means there can be runs on the bank and an economic crash. Eliminate paper currency, and what you end up with is the elimination of the ability to demand to withdraw funds from the bank. 
So this is taking away the only leverage you have over the bank and the economic system. This is why negative interest rates are evil. Because it's forcing you to be a part of this system that's totally built on debt. And the scriptures say the borrower is servant to the lender, and now you are essentially a permanent slave to the banking system through this system. Armstrong sums it up like this. He says, Rogoff and Buter have laid the groundwork for the end of much of our freedom, and one day will be considered the new Marx with hindsight. They sit in their lofty offices, but do not have real-world practical experience beyond theory. Considerations of their arguments have shown how governments can seize all economic power and destroy cash in the process of eliminating all rights. So this is why we're seeing this big push towards a cashless society. This is why this is coming in so quickly, paying with the cell phones, even paying with your fingerprint, your palm print, your iris, whatever it might be, because they're really pushing this program of a cashless society they think that this is what is going to save their butts from a total meltdown of the global economy. Look at this. A team of scientists led by University of Illinois professor John Rogers has created a new, less intrusive way of gathering data from the human body. Unlike conventional equipment that hardwires patients to a stationary machine, the epidermal electronics, as they're called, attach to the skin in the same way you would attach a temporary tattoo. Our thought was that if you could convert the electronics from the rigid boxy form that it exists today into a format that looks like the skin in terms of mechanical properties, uh, shape, uh, stretchability, toughness, uh, then you could almost make like a second skin that would laminate on the surface of the uh, biological skin in a completely seamless, integrated fashion uh, that would be essentially invisible to the user, but able to deliver all of this kind of new functionality through the skin. Uh, so the trick is, how do you go from a rigid silicon wafer-based type of electronics, which is the dominant form of electronics today, into an electronics that offers those same kind of performance or operating characteristics, but in the format of a tissue-like or skin-like form. Researchers developed S-shaped circuits that can move with the skin, expanding, contracting, and twisting without affecting performance. Through this technology, the team has been able to demonstrate a variety of devices on the electronic platform, including EMG sensors, LEDs, and solar cells. Other demonstrations have shown the wearers controlling video games. Uh, the kind of functioning systems that we uh, demonstrated in this paper uh, involve devices that can monitor brain function, so they laminate onto the forehead and they can monitor brain waves and determine you know, certain aspects of brain activity. So, uh, since the uh, characteristic of our device is very similar with epidermis, if we cover it with conventional uh, temporary tattoo, uh, first of all, other people cannot see it. So it is uh, very easy to wear. And since we are using wireless system, uh, the patient or people can move uh, and do normal life without any restriction. We can recover high quality signals in this kind of skin-like epidermal system uh, that are comparable to uh, state-of-the-art uh, conventional electrodes that involve bulky uh, pads strapped to the skin. So the fidelity of the measurement is, uh, is equal to the best uh, existing technology that's out there today, but in this very unique skin-like form. Well, that is an example of the kind of technology that could be used for a cashless system. And you can see that 
this technology can do a lot more than simply function as cashless money. As they were talking about, this can actually monitor your brain waves. There is research underway right now to actually read people's minds with brain waves. It's kind of an amazing thing to think about. There is technology today that actually monitors your voice. You know, sometimes when you think, as a matter of fact, we all think in words, particularly when we're thinking concepts, and we don't even know this, but our body is mouthing these words. There's technology today that can actually sense these movements within your body and can hear these words that you think you're just thinking. And so that itself is kind of like reading your mind, even though it's not exactly reading your mind. This kind of technology could be used for this sort of thing, for example. We could see that this totally interfaces with a computer. This can totally connect to the internet to keep you connected to the internet at all times, to monitor you, to monitor what's going on in your body. It can maintain all of your records, everything. All hidden under a tattoo that affixes to your body where it blends right in with your own skin can easily be in a convenient place like your hand or even on your forehead. When else in history has this prophecy about the mark of the beast been even technically possible? And now we are living in this time when this indeed is technically possible, and we see that the elite of the world are actually pushing towards a cashless society. Here's some conclusions about that. The first thing we have to acknowledge is that a cashless system is being promoted. People are being taken down the garden path from one technology to another to finally get us there. The UN Agenda 2030 shows us that this is planned to be implemented by 2030. However, concern for the sovereign debt crisis and the economic meltdown could bring a cashless society much sooner than that. Our third point, while this system may be introduced in as unthreatening a manner as possible, it will undoubtedly provide the framework for the mark of the beast to eventually arise. This is how government works. This is how the banking system works. They introduce something. When they introduce it, they might even pay you. You know, when PayPal was a brand new thing, back in the 90s, I think it was like around 1995, I signed up for PayPal, and they gave me $5. And since then, how much have they charged me for all of the transactions that I've done through PayPal? And yet, it's been convenient, it's worked on the internet, it's met a need. But it has brought us a step closer to the cashless society. It keeps moving further forward. These different innovations are not in themselves wrong. After all, there's not a lot of difference between being signed up with PayPal, for example, and having a credit card from your bank. It's really the same thing. They both have all your information, right? But it has to do with a way of thinking to get you used to the idea of no cash. 
when finally they take the cash away from us, I'm sure they'll give us certain incentives to come on the system. They're going to have to invite back a lot of cash that's out there. And so they're going to have to figure out a way to entice people to turn all that cash into digital currency. They're going to have to deal with that somehow. So at first, they're going to use the carrot instead of the stick. But once everybody is on the system, then you have a different story because they're totally in control then. Acceptance is not an issue anymore when there is no cash. And then they pretty much are going to be able to do what they want. And there's a lot of pressure towards this because the whole world banking community wants this. And I think we can see that governments want it. Can you imagine the kind of control that governments will have through this system? You know, a lot of people thought that Obamacare was very intrusive. Imagine how intrusive this is if they could just decide to take whatever payments they wanted right out of your account. So all of this is on the horizon, and when the cashless system comes, it may not be the mark of the beast when it happens, but it will be the infrastructure that when the Antichrist comes, he can then adopt for that use in order to cause everyone in the world to worship him and his system. So I think we would agree when we understand this that avoidance of this system, even before it is utilized by the beast, is probably advised. For us to start working to wean ourselves from this system is advisable. But since it's going to be a global system, we wonder, is that even going to be possible? The big question then is how do we get out of that system? Well, there's a lot to say about that. We started talking about that in our last message. We saw the Lion of Judah holds the key. It has to do with the remnant exodus. It has to do with getting out before the beast gets control of that system, before he arises to power. This leaves a lot of questions. We're going to go into this part of it how we can actually avoid this before it ever even happens. Even though this can be scary, thinking about these kinds of things, we want to always remember that Messiah is on the throne. And he can make a way where there is no way. And if we trust him, he's going to be there for us. What he said is, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things we need will be added to us. This is his promise, and he will make good on this promise if we put first his kingdom and his righteousness. He has a plan. We want to know about that plan. Mm -hmm.